people who live in apartment buildings and the newer condo buildings basically don't count. This comes back to this idea that houses are important and houses can't be touched, even though in practice, houses are less important. So the way to fix that, I think, is through reducing the amount of local control by having governments at a higher level, so the provinces in Canada, step in and take this power away from cities. And Hi, and welcome to The Missing Middle. I'm Kara Stern. And I'm Mike Moffat. And today we've got architecture critic for The Globe and Mail, Alex Bzikovic, joining us. But before we get to that conversation, please like or subscribe or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Welcome, Alex. Thanks, Kara. Yeah, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. A lot of us who are passionate about getting more housing supply out there uh, kind of see heritage rules as a bit of an obstacle. And that's something that you've written about. So we're really grateful that you're here to help talk about and uh, help us understand it a little bit more. Right. Um, obviously, we understand like there's a need to respect history, but it seems like it's been used in, as a way to block housing, housing supply. So I guess let's start with what is the difference between a building that's been listed as heritage and one designated as heritage? I understand there's a difference there. Yeah. So in Ontario, uh, the, the Ontario Heritage Act, you know, governs all of this stuff. And that's policy that's roughly 50 years old. And the distinction that you just mentioned between designated and listed really is about degrees. So something that's been listed that essentially doesn't have a lot of power. It sort of indicates that the thing is important and that the building usually is important. And if it's um, designated, then government essentially has some significant power in stopping it from being changed. And so in practice, something that's listed may be vulnerable to being demolished or being removed, whereas if you uh, designate it, it gets a little bit more complicated. Okay, so on that, you know, my understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there's about 11,000 uh, properties in Toronto that are either designated or listed. That seems like a lot to me. Is that a lot compared to other uh, North American cities? It is a lot, I think, is the short answer. And this is a subjective question, of course, because, you know, you're basically asking, are there that many buildings that are important enough to be commemorated in some way? And I as someone who cares deeply about architecture and architectural history, my answer would be no. Um, but what we've seen happen in Toronto and more generally across Canada is that the scope of what's heritage just keeps growing. Um, the heritage profession has started to understand that the way they tell stories and the kinds of stories that focus on have been too limited. And they've responded by expanding the scope of what they care about, essentially, and expanding the scope of the kinds of things they want to protect. And that's how we've gotten to uh, that big number and have gotten to where we are. Yeah, there's a lot of places that I've seen listed as heritage, or I'm actually not sure if they're designated or listed, but you see places that um, are considered heritage hard to rebuild there. And some of them are like a heritage dry cleaner in a very normal building. There was a heritage pizza pizza in the neighborhood where I used to live. And I always thought that was kind of weird. Like, I'm like, it's like, it looks nice, I guess, to have these storefronts, but also like, does that mean we shouldn't build there. Why do the, are they used to stop building? Is that what people are doing with them? Well, I think the short answer is it's complicated, but yes. Um, <laughs> there may be different intentions at play, um, but the effect of heritage preservation generally is to stop development from happening. And what I like to say about heritage is that it takes all of the existing patterns that we have in municipal politics and in housing politics and intensifies them. So the kinds of things that powerful people don't want to change, heritage protects. And the kinds of things that powerful people don't care about, heritage also tends to be to care about less and to protect less. Yeah, I know we've seen a lot of, uh, we want to get to this in a little bit, but I know that there has been a little bit of a talk about how much, it, how it's been done, whether it's been equitable, what's been protected and not, but let's, I uh, want to... Yeah, yeah so, so does this heritage uh, des designation, does it prevent building the kind of density we need to, uh, you know, meet our, you know, not just our housing crisis, but our climate crisis? The short answer is yes. Um, there, we can imagine a different way of building cities. We can imagine a different model of planning in which heritage was not in conflict with density. But in practice, it is. So let me spin that out a little bit. Right now, Toronto is a very clear example of a broad pattern across the country, which is that growth only happens in a few places, right? Essentially, you can only build an apartment building 
realistically on something like three or four percent of all of the land in the city of Toronto. And those numbers are similar for other places. And the way that planning has evolved over the last 40 years is that where that density is allowed to go is almost always on main streets and it's around transit stations. And those are the places where historically street life has happened that have been the economic and cultural centers of the community and heritage therefore is interested in those places. So we're basically saying you can't put new density in our cities anywhere except in these specific pockets. And also these specific pockets are the places that have the stuff that's important and we don't want it to change. So you can imagine, you know, if you, you know, unpack those two patterns that you could find another way to protect heritage resources, as they're called, and also add a lot of density. But that's not how the game is played. Is this just in Toronto? No, uh, it is, in fact, a North American wide pattern. Um, with some exceptions, this thing of wanting to put density on nodes and corridors, that's the, the phrase in planning. Um, it's now seen as good planning to put density not just anywhere, but in nodes, specific places or along corridors, which basically means along major streets. And we can talk all day about why that is, why it makes more sense to put buildings with a lot of people only on large roads, which have a lot of traffic and have a lot of air pollution and have a lot of noise. But that's the pattern that we have. And to some degree, that happens pretty much everywhere. It's just that in Toronto, because of certain quirks of how the Heritage Preservation Services group within Toronto City Planning has chosen to do things, they've really doubled down hard on this model of attempting to heritage protect large swaths of these main streets, which are also the places where density is allowed to go and to some degree where it makes sense for it to go. So a follow-up climate-related question. So, you know, we can't change those buildings, which might prevent us from building density. But does it also prevent a building owner from, say, putting up a solar panel or, or an EV charging station? Um, you know, so is, you, is that a thing? And, you know, does that sort of prevent us from making the sort of climate investments that we need to make? In the United States, it's a thing. Um, you know, heritage preservation in a number of American cities has that kind of force and, you know, has those kinds of impacts. Here in Canada, that's less true, but it is, you know, it's significant. I think the larger climate question here, though, is the one you've already alluded to, which is that climate action, housing and climate action fit together in the sense that having more people live in cities and in central cities where they can do more things without driving is by far the biggest action that any of our municipal governments can take to address the climate crisis. And it also has all of these other social and economic payoffs. but we can't do that because there are obstacles, at least, um, if not, you know, outright prohibitions on building density in many of these places where it would make sense. One of the areas I know in Toronto where there are those heritage uh, rules is along the Danforth. And that's one of those places I've talked about it before. I will talk about it again because yes. it makes me so frustrated. And it's one of the things that really got me interested in zoning rules was when I learned that, you know, this is somewhere where there was, a, there's been a subway forever there. Like, I don't even know when it was built, but it was a long time ago. You 60 know? years. 60 years. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's, been, it's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, and you'd think that some density would pop up around there, but it hasn't. And there's actually fewer people living in those neighborhoods now than 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't make any sense at all to me. Um, and I understand it's heritage. Is the, heritage was one of the reasons why that happened. Can you explain why? Like between, for people who know Toronto and between, I guess, Pape and broad view is kind of, a, that's all heritage, right? It is now. So heritage, you can't separate conversations about heritage with larger plan, from larger planning conversations. So ideas in planning about where big buildings should go and the shape of which they should take, which is known as urban design, essentially, you know, where buildings go in the city, how they relate to each other and heritage. Those are technically separate, but they're actually all the same thing. And they all come from the same roots which is, you know, in Toronto's history, what happened is that the city grew very, very quickly in the, from 1945 through the 1960s. And the population was growing, people were moving into the city, and Toronto built a ton of housing. And then there was this pushback at the end of the 60s, which combined these conversations we were, I was just mentioning, about planning, heritage, and urban design. And politicians essentially said, this has been too much. Um, we need to protect the fabric of the city from being destroyed. And that's the moment at which heritage preservation became a thing and at which Toronto, like other cities, chose to limit where you could build large buildings. And the Danforth at that point hadn't really been touched, but it was locked down. 
and any sort of change that would have happened there was prevented from happening from 1972 until very, very recently. And it's still very limited. Like I, I, remember, I remember seeing the staff recommendations, and I think it's is it six uh, stories in the front and eight stories in the back or something like that is what they recommended in the end, something like that. For the new plan that Toronto created for Danforth. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's so surprising to me. I'm like, just build along there, allow people to mm-hmm. fill it in. Cause like there's, there's lots of walkable uh, amenities around there. People don't necessarily need to drive, especially at the closer they get to Danforth. It doesn't make any sense. That's and right. I know a lot of people think about like Young and Eglinton's a spot that I know the neighborhoods, people don't realize this is that is also have lost people over the last 50 years. So the neighborhoods around Young and Eglinton are, are shrinking, but the number of people obviously at Young and Eglinton itself, that, that intersection, like that's seen as just like construction nightmare and has been for many, many years, as, like as long as I can remember. Right. Um, can why we talk about there? that actually? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, you know, Young and Eglinton is a really interesting um, example of this concentration of density that we're talking about. So what's happened is that you know, in Canada, the provinces have the power over land use, and the province of Ontario had sort of forced Toronto into creating a series of what are called growth centers, um, places where they wanted to focus new growth. And Toronto chose Young and Eglinton for one of those, but not the whole general area of Young and Eglinton, the specific pocket of that neighborhood, which already has apartment buildings. So what is already the densest chunk of that neighborhood and by far the most um, ethnically and economically diverse chunk of that neighborhood is exactly where all the new stuff is going. So people's uh, homes and apartments are being torn down so that the buildings can be replaced with larger apartment buildings. Meanwhile, 100 meters away, there are houses on 50-foot lots in neighborhoods that are losing people, and all of that stuff is untouchable. Yeah, it's so, frustrating to watch. Like seeing like those houses, I always think about how like people don't want to have a house next door. They're like, if there's a, and Doug Ford talked about this uh, yes. very recently, uh, how people don't want four-story buildings. I mean, fourplexes are not necessarily four-story buildings, but he's saying people don't want four-story buildings right. beside them. It'll ruin their view. And I think, okay, great. So you're protecting the view of people who have these houses. Yes. And then you look at Young and Edmonton and people have these condos and you see how close together they are where and they've kind of taken away the, I think they've changed the rules so that you can actually build them closer together than they used to. Yeah. So like I live just south of Young and Eglinton, Young and Davisville, and that was a, a spot where there's like, there were a bunch of these buildings and now in between all these buildings, a little bit of grass that's there. They're like, oh, another building in between there and that's allowed and they don't care that the people who live in those condos or apartments, like they're going to be get no privacy at all. It doesn't seem to matter to politicians. I mean, fundamentally, people who live in apartment buildings and the newer condo buildings basically don't count because they're younger people, they're not politically organized, they don't vote. I mean, it is kind of as simple as that. And the planning profession has reinforced that tendency because the planning in the city of Toronto specifically and across the country generally has adopted the idea that houses and house neighborhoods are important and need to be protected because they have something to do with reinforcing the social fabric of the city. And therefore they are not, they should not change. Whereas apartment buildings, who cares? You, should, you can see it at Young and Eglinton. Like it's a very visual um, representation of that like mm-hmm. inequality there where like you can see the, them together and then the low rises. I think that it's done a very good job at, at being able to explain to people the problem because you're like, just look at it. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, But then also just go west of there and that's where they're building the new, well, the cross town is going all across Eglinton, but right. just west of there is where they have a little Jamaica. Yeah. And I know that um, city councilor Josh Matlow really spearheaded trying to get that designated heritage and that was successful um, and saying that this is an equity thing where you had people in neighborhoods that were historically black that were not uh, protected in the same way that some of the whiter neighborhoods were protected for heritage. What are your thoughts on that? It's complicated because heritage policy really has to do with physical places and mostly with buildings and then with like the specific architectural aspects of a building. And the conversation about Little Jamaica, I think is a complicated one because that is essentially a neighborhood where a cluster of immigrants, you know, created a place to gather, right? And there are analogs to those in every city, the Chinatowns and Little Lilies in every city. The buildings themselves are less important in that kind of model. And the specific buildings in this place on Eglinton and Toronto are really kind of nothing special. Right. And so how do you use heritage? The policy question is, how do you use heritage to create or to preserve a sense of um, a place of cultural gathering, a place of belonging in restaurants, in grocery stores, in barber shops? And heritage is not really a good lens through which to do that work. 
Um, and, you know, the city of Toronto is working on that earnestly, I think. But the relevant lesson there, I think, is just to understand that density goes in places where in neighborhoods that are less powerful, right? The effects of growth are always going to go in our system into places and onto communities who have less power. It's so hard because you like, I understand why there's a need to protect that kind of heritage. But at the same time, like you're putting a new subway there, basically an LRT, you're putting a new uh, rapid transit system. Right. You need to build density around it, right? Like, wouldn't that just make sense to do that? It would. And I think actually there is a bit of a twist I would put on this conversation, both in Toronto and in other cities, this thing of core density on corridors, of putting all the new buildings on the big street actually destroys all the places that are interesting and important. Right. Mm. We were speaking earlier about this, that, you know, the cultural and the economic life of a neighborhood, if you're interested in that, you should be looking at protecting the main street of that neighborhood, because often that's how the pattern works. And while governments will often talk about that, they're also pushing all the density on top of it. So if you've got to put more density into a place, if a neighborhood is going to grow, why not let some of the houses on either side of that main street be redeveloped while the storefronts and whatever institutions are on the main street are protected. That's a great idea. Turn it around. Can people like listen to what you're saying and make that happen, please? <laughs> I would like to. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to, I'd love to see that happen. Um, but it's just, you know, the, again, heritage and other kinds of planning are inseparable, right? And it comes back to this idea that houses are important and houses can't be touched, even though in practice, houses are less important than all the other stuff. If we're talking about how our communities function. Yeah. So, so Kara asked kind of, kind of jokingly, like, can, can people do this? I'm going to look like, who are these people? Like who actually decides all of this? The provinces and the cities. So the province is responsible for land use. And so they have a sort of oversight power and they could also like step in. Yeah. There's been some discussion about this recently in Ontario, about whether the province of Ontario will actually rewrite cities, official plans. Because cities are responsible for the details of how growth happens, but the province can overrule them at any point, right? They don't because it's politically difficult, but they could. And so I think the problem that you have in Toronto as in other places is that local governments don't really want to take the policies they've created over the last 40 years and throw them out, which is what needs to happen. Because the people who have built those policies believe in them in some cases, and are very defensive about them in other cases. And so, you know, to get politicians to tell their planning departments, actually, guys, all of the work that you've done over the last 10 years, burn it and put it in, put it in the ground. Um, that's very hard. So the way to fix that, I think, is through reducing the amount of local control by having governments at a higher level, for the provinces in Canada, step in and take this power away from cities and essentially impose a different pattern of growth and a different pattern of density on them. And that's what BC is talking about doing right now. I think to, you know, which could be very, very powerful if they follow through and actually force cities to do the detailed work of changing all of their detailed regulations to actually make it happen. And then there's neighborhoods like Rosedale, like that's one that, you know, it's, it's really close to Young and Bloor, which is the busiest transit station. There's so much around there. Mm -hmm. I always find that a little bit surprising that, I mean, not really surprising. I assume it's because it's a wealthy neighborhood that it hasn't seen the density, but it, like, it probably should just because of location. How did it get away from getting any development? So Rosedale has been one of the richest and most powerful neighborhoods in the country since it was first created when Toronto was a, a, a small town, essentially, right? In, you know, the middle of the 19th century. And the houses that were built there initially for very wealthy people were built in a way that um, made the whole neighborhood kind of a maze. Uh, it's difficult to find your way around and it's intended to be that way. Um, you know, it was designed through what are called picturesque principles. That explains why I always find it confusing and get lost when I'm trying to find something there. It's, you know, it's kind of supposed to be that way. It's not on a grid um, and feels cut off from the rest of the city. Now, what happened at a certain point is that some density did get built there. Because for a period of about a generation in the middle of the 20th century, it wasn't as desirable a place to live. So wealthy people were moving out of Rosedale into other neighborhoods like Forest Hill or further out into the suburbs in Toronto. And those big houses that were at that point, you know, 80 years old or 100 years old were no longer so desirable. 
So they got cut up into rooming houses or into apartments or, you know, architects with middle class incomes were able to buy them. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, those buildings were torn down or replaced by small apartment buildings. And that happened and the world did not end. Um, what happened was the neighborhood actually grew in population and became somewhat more diverse. And then through this process of sort of retrenchment of the 1970s, um, the progressive politicians of the 1970s said, you know, our neighborhoods are precious. We can't touch them. And this episode of, you know, density, this generation of building apartments, that's over. And so we've seen the results. Uh, Rosedale, like other neighborhoods in Toronto, has just become richer and richer, less and less well, less and less populated. And, you know, remains because of this combination of planning and heritage off limits from any further change. You pointed to a lot of times when the city or the province has designated something heritage that you don't think uh, should be. And then you've also pointed to times where they've not allowed, uh, they've not designated something heritage and it does get rebuilt. And yes. it's something that you're like, you're like, no, we're losing this perfect example. I think some of the brutalist buildings you've pointed to, sure. there's some examples of ones that you've written about. Um, if you were trying to fix it in a way so it actually is like respecting history and keeping something that is like that we could all look at and say this is the history of Toronto but allow development like what's the low hanging fruit solution in your mind I think the focus needs to be much more on public buildings and it needs to be much more on modernist buildings because the history of the city and the history of the country a lot of things happened after 1945 and in many ways the, the city of Toronto and the, the Canada that we know was created in to a large degree after 1945. So I'm thinking about public schools and public libraries and government buildings and the former Japanese Canadian Cultural Center, which I'm engaging with right now, which to me is designed by Raymond Moriyama, which is very likely to be, despite being heritage protected, is very likely to be reduced to like some chunks of facade attached Why? to a new condo building because the real power and heritage comes from neighborhood groups and it comes from neighborhood groups in wealthy neighborhoods because they created a pattern of defending their neighborhoods from change. I guess which, no one lives around there. That's it. And a building like this, which is a building that was publicly accessible, but is not publicly owned. It's a little bit out of the way. So nobody knows where it is. You have to drive to get there. You have to drive to get there. And the building itself is this, you know, very beautiful, but slightly peculiar modernist building that sort of draws from a bunch of important examples in Japanese 20th century architecture. It's really beautiful. For any, if anyone like has the time to go take a look, like it's, it's actually really, really nice. There. It's gorgeous. But that is not the kind of thing that the average voter cares about, right? In municipal politics. And it's not the thing that the average person who's interested in heritage and local history cares about. People think about architecture as you know, stuff that looks old. And what that means is stuff that was built essentially in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. It's probably made of brick. You know, it's got some decoration on the front of it. Um, you know, it looks like it is certainly not modernist. You know, it's probably fairly small in scale. It's something that you could describe as quaint, right? So these sort of vague cultural ideas we have about what's historic and what's old and what's important are all linked together. And that is often detached from a real sense of architectural history and a real sense of the cultural history of our places. And I think we have a lot of 19th century houses and they all are basically the same. <laughs> you don't need to protect them all. Although in your neighborhood, there's like, there's the Honest Eds uh, that used mm -hmm. to be there and that's gone. And I, I would have expected that they would have wanted to keep those lights and everything around there. Like what ever up happening with that? Well, they're going to put some lights back. So for those who don't know, this is the, you know, a giant oh, discount yeah, sure. store. So people can see. Excellent. Yes. So they're going to add some signs and lights to sort of bring back the vibe of what was there. But I think what's interesting about that large project is that there was the discount store, which was like a shed pieced together from a bunch of buildings that was kind of ramshackle. And there were also a set of houses or what had been houses. And there are about 30 of those which are now being largely preserved. And those have been turned into restaurants and shops. And now in this rebuilt version of the neighborhood, they're going to be once again, restaurants and shops. That's so interesting that they'd keep those and not like the main Honest Ed's part because that's the part that people picture. Right, they picture the signs and the lights. But this is it, right? I mean, you know, I did this book, Lost Buildings of Canada, um, 305 Lost Buildings of Canada, and often, the, which was looking at the kinds of places that are gone that people remember and have fond memories of. And surprisingly often, that comes down to a sign. 
or a facade, right? Because、mm-hmm. people remember what they can see. They don't care so much that I mean, some people might care that the building's gone, but it's more the visuals. That's right, and, and you know, if you're not closely engaged with a building or a place, you see what you see walking by. Is what you remember. That's your understanding of it, and so to a degree, heritage is shaped around that understanding, which can produce some acceptable results. Sometimes keeping the front facade of a building actually is useful. But I think the honest ed's development is really interesting because it keeps mostly these houses.、Uh, big chunks of these houses are kept intact, but they're folded onto a large building or accompanied by a much larger building. And so the architectural and sort of spatial aspects of the street are more or less kept intact, but there's a ton of density stuck onto the back of one of these blocks. Which sounds great, but also sounds expensive to build. It's expensive. There's no question that it's expensive. Like it adds to the cost of the development, right? Oh, no question. I mean, the heritage preservation there. You know, it would be much easier to tear down a bunch of houses from 1890 than it is to restore the brickwork and to fold them into a larger building. But I think in cases like that, where it's a large development. The benefits of that can be real.、Mm. At the same time, what makes that place interesting—the side street that's part of this development, which is called Markham Street—what makes it interesting is that it's a lot of houses that got turned into restaurants and shops and offices. So and let's let that happen elsewhere now to actually make new ones. Precisely. That's Hopefully it. Hopefully, people will see, will listen, and we'll start seeing some of those changes in the future. That just makes a lot of sense to me. Like, if that's what people like, that's what should, we should allow it. Stop saying we'll preserve this one. And not allow any new ones to be built. Thanks so much for like helping us understand that. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I learned a lot. It's great to have you here. My pleasure. Thanks so much for watching and listening. And thanks as always to our producer Meredith Martin. And if you have any burning housing questions, please send them to us at missingmiddlepodcast at gmail dot com. And we'll see you next time.